Hello and welcome everyone to the 24th edition of our Fusion EP Talks. The Fusion EP Talks is a student-led webinar series where we talk about nuclear fusion science, engineering and technology. And our speakers are ranging from students who are currently pursuing their PhD, researchers who are already established and in positions, and also anyone who wants to participate in our effort to popularize the fusion. For today's talk, we have Mr. Alexi Devitre, who is currently pursuing his PhD at the Hent University, and he's working for his PhD at the Plasma Fusion and Science Center, PSFC at MIT in Boston, Massachusetts. He has a master in nuclear fusion science and engineering physics. He obtained it from the Ghent University with distinction magna cum laude. And for the master thesis, he also obtained the prize from the Belgian Nuclear Society for the best master thesis. He has previously worked at the Institute for Plasma Physics in Prague, and he's currently also working, as I mentioned, at, uh, at MIT. In today's talk, uh, he will be talking about the work that he did for his master thesis at the Laboratorio Nacional de Fusión in, in Siemat in Spain. And without taking further time, I would mention one small thing that uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him to all of you because this whole program is his own brainchild. Without uh, taking furthermore, uh, I give it to you, Alexis. Over to you. Thank you, Deval, for the introduction. Um, and welcome everyone, whether you're joining us uh, live or on our YouTube channel. I would like to take, as the initiator of the Fusion EP Talks, I'd like to take a moment to thank um, our team, Deval, but also Katya Matveva, Francis Albert, uh, Jose Treva, uh, Tobias Yesha, and Mohamed Ezat from uh, Egypt Plasma, who is currently supporting our email server. Um, they're all alumni of the European Master in Fusion Science and Engineering, and without their help, uh, none of this would be possible. Now, the thing I enjoyed the most in my short career in fusion is the opportunity to work with a diversity of people from uh, several cultural and technical backgrounds. And I've had the immense privilege uh, to get to know and interact with most of the actors of the story I'm about to tell you. That said, let's have a, a look at a few basics first. And in mag as you know, in magnetic fusion, uh, we use these donut shaped devices, such as the stokamak, to recreate the conditions inside the stars uh, and har harvest energy. Now, if you take a slice of this donut, you'll see a structure very much like this drawing on the left or this drawing on the right, uh, which essentially serve, these configurations essentially serve the same purpose, which is to focus the flux of high energy, uh, well, the high energy flux of particles and heat onto specifically designed surfaces to localize and control plasma wall interactions. Now, there are two main reasons for doing this. And the first is quite simple. It's because if you are trying to build a fusion reactor, you want your physical components to last as long as possible. The second reason is that as you operate your tokamak, you're trying to maintain a delicate balance in the core for fusion, to ha fusion reactions to happen. And the wall can let go of many impurities and cold particles that can jeopardize this uh, delicate balance. So if you would like to know more about what the plasma can do to the wall, I recommend that you check out uh, Tobias' talk on our YouTube channel on the effect of fast ions uh, on the plasma facing components of a large stellarator in Germany called uh, Wendelstein 7X. If you'd like to know more on the effects that the walls can have on the plasma, Andrei Goriaev gave a great review talk earlier on uh, on the um, range of um, on the range of strategies that uh, are implemented in W7X to control uh, plasma wall interactions of wall conditioning. 
now let's have a closer look at what can happen when plasmas meet solid surfaces. So whether it's because of the sheath potentials or the pressure gradients in our tokamak, we'll eventually have a flux of high energy particle impinging on the wall, which uh, part of which can be reflected into the plasma. Other parts can be absorbed by physical or chemical mechanisms. The, the absorbed or trapped particles can eventually resurface and recombine into volatile molecules that can be reionized and regain the plasma. And the issue that we have here is mainly with these particles, which are much colder, much, much colder than our plasma. And as they return, they'll cool it down and waste some of the precious energy that we've invested in creating and heating this plasma. Now, over the years, uh, fusion scientists have realized that these interactions are uh, mainly confined to the surface. That is the first few, uh, the first few tens of nanometers. And contingency that they've developed is to uh, deposit some thin layers of chemically active materials on these walls, to, uh, which can form strong bonds with uh, the cold fuel particles, the hydrogen, and common impurities such as oxygen. Examples of these that are quite common in the community are boron or lithium. And if you're at JET or ITER, you might also want to use beryllium. However, most experiments avoid beryllium due to its high toxicity. This, my story tonight starts at the TJ2 Stellarator in Spain, which is a small to medium sized device designed to study confinement in support of larger devices such as uh, W7X in Germany or the large helical device in Japan. And at the, in, in its early days, TJ2 relied solely on its 600 kilowatts of electron cyclotron heating, which if you've heard the term, you will know that uh, it uh, depends on our ability to maintain uh, consistent density profiles. However, TJ2 was quite hindered by the so-called wall fueling or the uh, ejection during the discharge of cold hydrogen particles from the wall. And it took a lot of work from Paco and David um, to who divide, who tried out many different conditioning scenarios summarized in this 2010 paper to get this wall fueling under control. They eventually succeeded. And if you're interested in seeing uh, how they, their effort, their efforts allowed the machine to reach its design performance and better scientific output, I recommend that you have a look to this 2008 article in uh, in, PP, in uh, plasma, oh, plasma Physics and Confined Fusion. Uh, we'll post the links in uh, the recording. Now, over the years, and because Paco and David were not working in a uh, large device uh, where they would have had to compete, uh, constantly compete for time and resources, uh, they were able to try many ideas. And one of them, uh, which they realized was uh, very useful, was to combine lithium and boron films. By doing so, they realized that the beneficial effects of the wall conditioning would last up to three times longer than for uh, conventional lithium or boron films. Uh, once again, if you would like more information, I recommend this reading. Now, eventually, as this idea grew, they, uh, Paco needed more resources to really prove uh, this concept. And uh, those resources were found, for example, on the uh, National Spherical Experiment Taurus in the United States. Uh, in particular, there was there's a very interesting diagnostic called the Material Analysis Particle Probe, which brings directly into the edge of the tokamak a series of surface but also plasma diagnostic that allow to study both systems in parallel and during uh, and simultaneously. Um, this is really the Swiss knife of uh, plasma wall interactions. 
in Fusion. So Paco came to Princeton, where NSDX is based, and asked Bob if he could borrow some time on his tokamak. And Bob said, well, of course, Paco. In fact, the first campaign of NSDX uh, is partly dedicated to comparing the effects of, um, of boron and lit to, to those of lithium films. And I think your experiment would fit just nicely in between. As a matter of fact, we just hired a very, uh, Felipe, a very motivated PhD student who will be able to run the test for us. Now, if you've come across Felipe's thesis, you'll see that the word lithium is nowhere to be found. And uh, this is unfortunately because after 10 months of boron operations, one of the coils of an SDX failed and Felipe had to find something else to do. Which did not prevent him from writing a very nice paper on the material analysis probe that um, I highly recommend. Now, at the end of the story, I get a master's diploma. But in order to do this, I had to build, uh, I had to put together an experiment that allowed me to better understand uh, the interactions between lithium films deposited over boron, uh, over a boron substrate uh, with oxygen and deuterium gases and plasmas. Uh, this experiment may look a little bit messy in the picture, but I've broken it down to its main components for you in this diagram. Uh, and it's essentially a, one system that allows me to deposit boron um, on the walls. It's uh, this oven right here. Uh, it's on the main uh, port of this cylindrical chamber, so you cannot see it in the uh, scheme. Um, a system to deposit lithium films over this boron, which you see here, and a quadrupole mass spectrometer with a dual connection, a high vacuum and a medium vacuum connection to the vessel. Now, I will explain you soon uh, how to use this quadrupole mass spectrometer uh, for our purposes. But first, I would like to um, introduce the protocols that I used for walk and the devices that I used for wall conditioning. Um, in fusion experiments worldwide, boronization is operated via plasma-assisted chemical vapor deposition, which is quite a mouthful for a process that can be summarized by the decomposition of a boron-rich molecule in a, a noble gas discharge. In our case, this molecule is orthocarburane, and it comes in the form of stable white crystals that are not hazardous unless you want to make them. And, um, and the procedure is very simple. You will basically refill your oven here with carburane, turn on a plasma, open the gate valve, and slowly ramp up the temperature in the oven. As you do this, uh, you'll start seeing on your spectrometer large uh, the time trace of signal of corresponding to large carburane fragments, particularly mass 40 and 70, as well as uh, the production of hydrogen gas from uh, the molecule again. Uh, when those signals uh, fall, you can have a pretty good confidence that you've exhausted your carburane and uh, that you have about 120 nanometers of boron carbon on the walls. For lithiumization, for lithiation, I developed my own system based on uh, a capillary mesh, uh, based on um, uh, a thermoresistor around which I wrapped a, um, a fine mesh of stainless steel. This system can be inserted or retracted, inserted in the main vessel or retracted behind the gate valve by this manual, this uh, horizontal manipulator. Behind the gate valve, we have an oven that contains solid lithium rods 
from which the CPS can draw lithium by uh, through this wick. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how we infuse the CPS with lithium in the next slide. But before this, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the bottom plot, where you can see in blue the time trace of the temperature as given by a thermocouple placed uh, halfway along the CPS. As you see, um, as we start heating uh, the device, we go through the solid to liquid phase transition. We eventually uh, get a temperature increase. And at about 500 degrees C, we just cut off the, the input power and let the CPS cool down to 400 degrees. At this point, the evaporation is pretty low, and we can retract the device behind the gate valve. And this process uh, gave us uh, fairly consistent 60 nanometer depositions, which we benchmark using a quartz microbalance. Uh, and, and, the, and, and we could es also estimate the number of lithium in the film uh, by integrating the HKL flux, as you see here. Now let's have a look at uh, the wetting. In this video, you see a red hot capillary porous system dipping into a, uh, li the lithium oven. And both systems are at about 550 degrees C. And soon, at, soon you will see lithium creep up the wick and spread over the, uh, the mesh right here. And by the end of this video, our window will be quite dirty. And you wouldn't be able to see much anymore. However, uh, we thought of that and installed a uh, gated window on the other side to take this beautiful picture that I'm sure you've already seen in the flyer. If you'd like to know more about this, lithium, this litiation system, I invite you to uh, look out for my upcoming paper, which incidentally was just submitted, I just submitted this morning. And now that you know more about the boronization and litiation protocols, I'd like to show them to you, to use them as an example to introduce uh, the use of a mass spectrometer. Um, in this example, we are conditioning or our vessel or depositing um, a lithium over a boron uh, substrate. And you see here the time trace of the quadrupole mass spectrometer signal for several uh, molecules, such as hydrogen, uh, mass 28, which can be either nitrogen or uh, carbon monoxide, mass 70 and 40, which generally corresponds to uh, those large carburane fragments, um, and mass 4, which can be either deuterium or, but in this plot will be helium. So here you see several events that I've mentioned before, the opening of the gate valve, the production of large carburane fragments, uh, the rise and actually and their fall over time. Uh, at this point, boronization is pretty much over. And um, what we see in the second part are events corresponding to um, the, the, liti the litiation, particularly one big peak at the beginning and one at the end in the nitrogen signal, which correspond to the insertion and the retraction of the CPS. Uh, we know this because uh, there's a little O-ring at the back, which slightly gets displaced and uh, momentarily lets in a little nitrogen, as you can see. Uh, in between those peaks, we also have a third one, which corresponds to the temperature maximum of the CPS, when uh, many, many lithium particles are being evaporated, uh, hitting the wall and displacing uh, volatiles that are physiosorbed, such as uh, uh, hydrogen and helium. Now that our device is conditioned with a layer of uh, boron and one of lithium, um, what else? Uh, we want to expose it to um, oxygen and deuterium to know how much um, 
how much of it it can bind. And once again, the mass spectrometer can be very useful in um, understanding what's going on. Uh, so starting from a very simple case where we do not have a plasma and we do not have a chemically active surface, we can very easily calibrate the partial pressure um, indicated by the mass spectrometer with respect to the mass flow indicated by the mass flow controller that is injecting the gas. Um, and that gives us a, 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 a very well resolved measurement of the instantaneous flux. With a plasma or a getter, we get additional sources and sinks at the wall, but also within the plasma where particles constantly break down and recombine. However, assuming that our calibration remains valid and that the wall can pump all available uh, oxygen or deuterium until saturation, um, we can start putting numbers on our uptakes. And I will take the orange curve here as an example. Uh, this orange curve is a lithium film that is being exposed to oxygen gas. At T equals zero, the gas is injected into the chamber, but we don't see the signal because the wall is pumping this oxygen. But about three and a half minutes later, the signal rises again, indicating uh, the saturation of the wall. And now this uh, shaded surfaces here, this hash surfaces, uh, is the uh, integral uh, during this time interval that gives us uh, the total number of particles that, was, that were pumped by the wall. Now you could tell me, uh, well, yeah, but this uptake will, of course, depend on, your, on how much lithium you sprayed. I'll say yes, of course. But uh, bear in mind that we do know how much lithium we've sprayed quite precisely. And therefore, we can use a proper normalization to start making comparisons. Oops, sorry. Now, in this, uh, I would like to first comment the upper right plot where uh, freshly formed layers of lithium in orange and boron in green are exposed to oxygen gas or oxygen plasmas. Um, and it's important to stress the distinction because uh, we want our layers to pump impurities during plasma operations, but we don't want their performance to degrade between operations. So, the first thing we see is that the plasma uptake of, uh, in the boron case is pretty much the same or slightly better than the simple lithium. And that might be because the boron is insulating the, is providing some form of insulation to the lithium layer from the oxygen that is already present in the wall. But more importantly, when we look at the molecular uptakes, we see that uh, the lit lithium with boron uh, collects up to three times less oxygen from a gas. Um, this, again, is extremely important because it addresses an issue that is common to all magnetic fusion devices, uh, which is operational in nature. And it's that the fact that we often perform the conditioning on the night before or during uh, before experiments or during the weekend. And until we actually get to the experiment, the layer may have degraded, as you see in uh, the center result in the bottom plot. After 18 hours of um, dwelling in the residual gas, the performance of the simple lithium is cut by half. The, in the boron case, the lithium film is more is preserved longer. Um, so what this bottom plot also tells us is that um, the oxygen uptake from a gas 
does not prevent the lithium layer from collecting oxygen from a plasma uh, in the boron case. But in the simple lithium case, the performance will degrade at a rate which corresponds to the available amount of oxygen. And once again, these results are explained in more details in our paper. Now, I've also, I also performed uh, some deuterium uptake, some deuterium retention test. And the first thing to note here is that all of these points are plasma uptakes. And that is because we did not observe any molecular deuterium uptake with or without boron. The next thing to address is the elephant in the room, which will come as no surprise to the members of the well conditioning community. And it's the well-known fact uh, that has been studied for more than 10 years in simulations, uh, laboratory, and in situ experiments that um, oxygen, uh, that deuterium retention in uh, lithium films is correlated to the, um, to the amount of oxygen in the layer. Now, this comes in stark contrast to what we saw in the boron case, we saw a very stable, a very um, consistent deuterium uptake that does not seem to depend on the oxygen content. And if you're trying to um, minimize recycling at all costs to get, for example, to the super shots in PFTR, then you'll say, well, this is no use to me. However, if you're trying to get reliable density profiles for, uh, ECH, for ECH in TJ2, like uh, Paco and David, then this is exactly what you want. For my last result, I would like to come back to the, to the raw data to show you that um, maybe the most surprising feature of lithium layers deposited on a boron substrate which is their ability to regenerate in after a glow discharge cleaning. So this boron lithium here that seemed to have saturated under molecular oxidation will apply a about 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes of uh, helium plasma to it. And we see afterwards that uh, the, it regains its, per, its ability to collect uh, molecular, that little bit of molecular oxygen that we saw two slides ago. We, of course, tried this on all of the getter properties, and we find that it is a general property. Um, all of these films, seem, uh, the lithium film, lithium over boron seems to be able to regenerate uh, its getter after a glow, uh, glow discharge cleaning, uh, whether it's, a, it's plasma or gas gettering or deuterium plasma gettering. Um, you'll note the absent uh, as a, and, it, and this is in stark contrast to the case of lithium, which after a single exposure is uh, completely deteriorated as far as our measurements can tell. Um, the, yeah. You'll notice here the absence of data concerning um, deuterium uh, retention in pure lithium. And this is mainly because we didn't have time to, I didn't have time to do the test, but I later found a paper by Hino from the 1990s where uh, the regeneration of lithium oxide is attempted. And once again, we get a similar result as uh, what we got up here, regenerations uh, up to 10%, which is below our ability to detect. Now, to wrap this uh, webinar, what I would like you to know about uh, boron lithium films is that their uptake, their plasma oxygen uptake is as good as lithium, as simple lithium or better, that they seem to be resilient to oxygen rich gases, which is excellent for uh, from an operational point of view. There, the deuterium retention in these films 
does not seem to depend on the oxygen content, which may or may not be useful depending on the application. But more importantly, we were able to regenerate the, the getter properties of these films using glow discharge cleaning. And I think this is the probably the most attractive property here. At this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, please go ahead and ask questions now or later by email. I'll do my best to, to give you an answer. Thank you very much, Alexis, for the wonderful insight about the great work you did. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that now we open the session for question and answer. Here you go. Okay, thank you, Deval. Uh, well, first of all, this is uh, a question a bit regarding my my own research. Uh, I think it was in pages seven and eight. You were talking about the the, the layer thickness, uh, the layer thicknesses of your of your lithium. Yeah. And I was uh, wondering if you had uh, performed any experimental measurements of these. Uh, in order to obtain these thicknesses, or you calculated them as a function of the absorbed uh, boron or, or lithium? Okay. Hi, um, Alex, and uh, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you, and thank you for your, your uh, excellent question. Uh, so we actually calculated and uh, measured these films. Um, I didn't mention it explicitly, but wrote it down here that uh, we had several silicon wafers uh, or small plates disposed all around the vessel to uh, test the um, uh, roughness of these layers. And we actually brought these to a um, stylus profile meter, if you're familiar with the technique, uh, that uh, gave us these estimates of uh, thickness. So that's the way we did it experimentally. Uh -huh. um, the calculation is, based, is very simple. We just um, assumed that all the boron and carbon is deposited on the walls and uh, make a, a quick estimate based on, um, on their density. So, uh, and we compared both. They gave similar numbers, but as you can see, uh, the profile meter measurements uh, give a, a pretty large uh, variation in that thickness. It's a very anisotropic. That's uh, why I was wondering, right? because that uh, 120 plus minus 80, yes. it was a bit OK. Hmm. All right, fair, fair enough. And then I, 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 another, another question, this one goes a bit, I think it was page 12 or, or 13, something like that, about oh, the, the fact I, that the Can I just add uh, one more thing about the yeah. lithium films? So the lithium films, uh, the, the measurement itself, we did using a quartz microbalance. So that was um, rather precise, yeah. uh, although it's a very local measurement. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we what we also did is we developed a finite element model that allowed us to calibrate the uh, this factor eta in the evaporation equation. And this is mm -hmm. how we and, and by integrating this uh, evaporative flux in time and along the CPS model, um, we were uh, able to corroborate this measurement with, um, with a, a somewhat numerical, semi-empirical estimation. Yeah, good. All right. Uh, and then my second question, I think it was page 12. Yeah, it was like page 12, 13, 14. That that uh, that page is regarding the the these 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 plots right there. Yes. Uh, so as far as I understand from here, the the boron kind of passivates the lithium uh, layer, so the, the the surface reactions between the lithium and oxygen are um, suppressed, sort of. And I think that's why you find a reduction in the in the molecular oxidation, because the oxygen molecules do not possess energy enough, chemical energy enough to actually affect the lithium. But once you have a plasma, then you increase the energy, and then they have enough enough energy to interact. I think that's more or less what is happening here. However, do you know how the boron can actually suppress that chemical energy? 
uh, it's not that the bar suppresses the chemical energy, it's that the, the, the I think the, the chemical configuration of the boron plus the lithium uh, makes that uh, that surface structure more stable than the than the metallic uh, lithium surface. So a, mm -hmm. a pure metallic uh, usually it has a high reactivity with uh, let it be oxygen, so it gets oxidized, or with hydrogen, and then the hydrogen got, gets uh, absorbed. But if you have a, a boron that is uh, interacting with the with the lithium, maybe the energy that a particle of oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen or whatever gas, it might need a higher a higher energy in order to actually be uh, absorbed by that material. Gotcha. Thanks for the comment. I think that's an yeah. interesting idea that uh, needs to be tested with maybe with uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to actually understand what's going on with the bonds there. Yeah. Um, I, and this this was actually somewhat beyond the scope of. Uh, yeah. I yeah. think it's a very high demand diagnostic in CMAT. I I tried to contact the person who had access to it, but it, it didn't fit the time of my master's thesis, unfortunately. Yeah. And then another comment on the, the fact that you were able to regenerate with the glow discharge. I, uh, am I right if I assume that it's, that it's because the, the, the discharge kind of um, spotted the, the surface? So, so then it's able to, to get again, to get again uh, more, uh, more oxygen in the next, in the next discharges? So this is only speculation, and mm -hmm. at this point, I think my guess is as good as yours. Uh, I would, um, I would think this is a reasonable idea, but once again, I think it needs to be tested. I, I think it's it might be reasonable to think indeed that the lithium is being uh, the lithium oxide is being sputtered, and maybe the oxygen uh, that was in that lithium can either recombine and be extracted by the pumping system or be uh, collected by the boron underneath. And then you have like a redeposition yes. of that lithium, uh, that, that fresh, refreshed lithium. Yes. It but this is only speculation. I yeah. think this is uh, something that uh, if I was, if I continued on this path, this is probably the mm -hmm. next thing I would want to look into. I just mentioned it because in my experience, I'm working also with uh, metallic, uh, membranes for, for hydrogen in this case. And that's what we, what we find that sometimes when you have a plasma, it spotters the, 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 a permeation layer, a permeation barrier that can usually it's created on top of, of metals as in the form of, a, of an impurity layer. And usually when you get a plasma, it cleans that surface again, and then you kind of uh, retrieve your original state. So from my perspective, that would be my first, my first guess, just to, to let you know. But there's definitely something going on uh, with the boron because this is something that we can't, we don't see with the just the lithium oxides. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the there's definitely something more the there. The chemistry of the boron is different, it's way different than the chemistry, chemistry of, the, of the oxygen. So that might be uh, um, a point where anybody could start doing some, some research on the different chemistry between boron and oxygen in this kind of, of metals. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for your question. Uh, we have another question from Matthew Riding. Uh, Matthew, I am about to unmute you, uh, so you can ask your question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, first, Alexis, for the really, really interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about the potential scale of the possible applications. Um, it seems like these uh, films are under investigation in some quite um, small scale devices, but I wondered if there are intentions to apply them to the sort of reactor scale research or the reactor scale designs. Um, uh, as well, and, and whether you could comment on, on other possible future applications. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Matthew. Um, I've actually asked this, this question to, um, um, boy, I keep forgetting his name. Um, 
he's uh, one of the authors of the classical uh, Tokamax book uh, by Wesson. Uh, anyways, he and what he responded, what his answer was at the time is that uh, this is really uh, meant for um, fusion experiments. Because as soon as you uh, move to a reactor, you, pro you will probably have tritium. And at this point, you'd be worried about tritium inventories. And uh, because these films are very avid of collecting hydrogen, uh, then uh, there, there might be concerns there. Uh, the other point he made, as I remember, was that these films would be quickly obliterated by the, uh, the, the plasma, fl plasma and heat fluxes in those, in those reactor class discharges. So I believe in either the beryllium is not really a film, it's a solid component that's uh, laid around on the walls to lower recycling. And it's, it's, there, there's a, a much thicker layer. I, I hope this somehow answers your question. That's great, thank you. So, so the, the main interest is for these tailored, very precisely controlled scenarios in the smaller scale experiments. Correct. You, you want to use them to broaden the operational range and the scientific, the potential scientific outputs of, your exp of today's experiments. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a, a question from Andre. Uh, just a sec, Andre. Yeah, and there you go. Ah, yeah. Uh, hello, Alexis. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Alexis again for the nice talk. So uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, before I just wanted to comment the uh, reply um, of Alexis to Matthew. So yeah, it's, it can be applicable. And for example, the plays a lot, uh, a huge role in the W7X, for example. So it's just technique of burnization, which were applied last experimental campaign. But the results of Alexis, and those studies are actually really useful because if they decided to go for um, long plasma operation, uh, for example, the, the effect of uh, lithium boron recuperation can, uh, like, can help a lot. Because you know that's not a que that's not only a question nowadays of the technique and efficiency. It's also a questions uh, questions of application. So and uh, this this procedure can be very expensive uh, uh, when you apply it on the huge device like W7X. Yeah. Um, then I will start with my uh, with my question. So Alexis, could you please go to the page number five? Um, yeah, here I was particularly interested in the adventures of Paco in the United States. And yeah, <laughs> just met this material analysis particular probe. Uh, and then I would like to ask you maybe like in few, in few sentences just to explain what is it for and uh, how it works. And maybe the link afterwards will be also nice. I would highly recommend to go to the link. I, I don't have a personal experience with the material analysis particle probe. Uh, I know that it's an extremely useful diagnostic that would certainly shed light on our, uh, on what we're observing. And to a certain extent, the story is semi-fictional. I'm not sure the material analysis probe was actually available in the early 2000s, uh, but this is certainly part of what you would be looking for uh, to expand on the research. Uh, now, as for what is of what diagnostics are available on the material analysis particle probe. There might be somebody in the audience from uh, LPX where it is currently installed uh, that can um, complement my answer. But as far as I know, there is um, definitely an XPS on it, an X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy diagnostic. There are, there are possibly quartz microbalances, probe heads. Um, and I don't want to make up anything, so I'll, I'll leave it there and let you uh, check in the details uh, in the paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, could you please go to the page number six now? Oh, and of course there should be a mass spectrometer in there. That's the, I guess, the basic, the very basic instrument. Uh, page 13, you said. 
No, 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 page number six. So. Six. Sorry, I skipped. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, here we go. That's uh, five. The question is yeah, just six. related to, uh, to the experimental setup. So you just mentioned, and what I can also see for, uh, from the sketch of, uh, of your experimental setup. So you have uh, two connections of... Um, mass spectrometer to the main chamber. So one is, the, as far as I remember, you said that it's a uh, high vacuum one and another one is I know, intermediate. So uh, my question is simple. What was the reason of this, uh, this double connection? The double connection? Yeah, the, the idea behind the double connection was to be able to monitor the, the evolution of the films during uh, the long exposure. Uh, you may remember uh, the first data that I showed, the bottom plot, had a, uh, an experiment where we left the films dwell for up to 18 hours in the residual background. And uh, when the pressures are extremely low like this, we're concerned that, uh, well, we wanna, we wanna have a direct access uh, to them. Uh, especially we wanna avoid uh, as much as possible the, the, uh, to lose track of uh, molecules that can condensate on the walls like like water um, and but maybe I should have started by explaining the the medium vacuum connection which has a reducing gasket as you see here so it's really just like a millimeter hole and that is important when you're doing I, I believe when I don't know for a fact, you, you, you can probably tell me, but I believe that when you install a mass spectrometer on a tokamak or a stellarator, you do need to strangle the connection because otherwise you get too much and you saturate the mass spectrometer. It's just operational when you want to diagnose uh, gases in plasmas at, at medium. Uh, okay, medium okay, I, I, I see, I see the reason now because so uh, usually there is a, let's say, differential diaphragm to control the uh, the pressure. Oh yes, but where are my setup is much more rudimentary. Oh okay, okay, okay. So okay. so it's uh, it's basically you know one of those copper gaskets, but it's actually yeah. uh, it instead of having like a full a full bore, it has just a tiny about like a millimeter hole in, in it. Okay, um, thank you. So uh, page number twelve. Yeah, Alex already asked you about uh, about the reasons of the um, uh, the oxygen uptake uh, urination during the residual gas exposure, but uh, I I don't really I don't really get the reason. I I know that it's not really clear, but uh, I would like to ask you once again. So what? What was the reason? What do you think? Just uh, because of the exposure to the residual gas, or there was something uh, like uh, surface chemistry behind? So, because I only have a mass spectrometer, what I'm going to say is mostly speculation. Uh, but I do believe there is a change in chemistry to the, due to the presence of the boron that. Um, limits or delays the absorption of molecular oxygen. What uh, Baco and David saw in TJ2 was that uh, when you use the boron substrate underneath the lithium film, uh, the positive effects of conditioning would last up to three times longer. And uh, I think it's because contrary to lithium, as you see in the bottom plot, uh, we don't have this degradation over time uh, because uh, somehow the molecular uptake is um, slowed down or uh, constrained. Okay, thanks. And uh, my last question related to the page number 14. Yep. Um, so here you mentioned that uh, you could see uh, the, let's say, <laughs> the recuperation of um, uh, of uh, your layer uh, when you use uh, when you apply helium GDC, right? Um, was it only for this specific combination of uh, boron and lithium um, 
films or you could also see it for some other things. So th there are some information in the literature for, for example, for pure boron layer or boron carbide layer or for lithium. Okay, for lithium, I already understand that it's not like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, once again, my boron layer is a boron carbon layer. So that's something to keep in mind also. Carbon yeah. might also put, might be playing a role too. Um, and in my experiments, I only compared the case of uh, simple lithium to uh, lithium over boron. So I couldn't tell you more except, um, yeah, yeah. At this point, I couldn't tell you if other combinations might also display this feature. Uh, okay, and maybe maybe the question which is related to your answer. So, uh, um, do you know whether Paco wants to continue uh, research in this direction to compare this uh, recuperation effects on other boron carbon layer combination and stuff like this? Well, this is very. Uh, I think this question should be addressed to Paco himself, but. Uh, I'm uh, sure there's a lot of interest, at least in TJ2, this uh, both conditioning, both uh, boronization and lithiumization cis, uh, conditioning procedures are still in place and, um, and used um, routinely. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite sure that they would be happy to know more about it and to really elucidate the, the mechanisms behind these um, enhanced, this, these interesting properties. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know about uh, the, the the surface science group in Princeton. They may also. Oh, excuse me. I did read a paper recently. Uh, there has been, if you look at, um, so if you look at this review by Predag Kastik from 2018, okay. he's he's more of a, on the simulation side, and uh, he essentially reviewed all this. Uh, experience with uh, uh, lithium gathering that has been developed for the last 10 years. And I believe there is a, a start of a simulation concerning uh, boron and lithium, com the boron and lithium combination in there. And at the, by the end of this paper, um, there is a mention about upcoming experiments at uh, the University of Illinois. I've looked for uh, results in this direction, but I haven't found them. So there, there might, there might be more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, for your, for your answers, and thank you so much again for your talk. Thanks for your questions. It's great to see you. Thanks a lot, Andre, for the question. We have another question from. Uh, I beg your pardon if I am not able to pronounce your name correctly. Chiri Adamek from IPP Prague. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jiri, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Is it okay? Hi. Okay, yes, hello, I hear you. hello, Alexis. Uh, nice presentation. I joined a little bit later, sorry. Um, uh, you might be aware probably that we already did the lithium experiment on compass and also lithium thin experiments. It's a pity I see this presentation now, not before. Uh, it was not not yet published, yeah. Uh, but in principle, there might be a possibility to do this, to do another experiment on compass tokamak, uh, maybe at the end of summer. You can pay attention to this, because we are of course using bor boronization and we are using lithium uh, as well. Uh, but we are going to the end of compass operation. But probably there will be a chance. Uh, now we are studying not exactly the films uh, of the. On the on the graphite tiles on the diverter, but I'm not sure. I will ask. By the way, in principle, uh, if there was some raised question about the future application of some fusion device, I think the compass is uh, the closest one uh, as a possibility because I don't see uh, in the near future if there will be some another open open possibility. Uh, maybe LTX. Yeah, do you plan it on LTX? Thank you so much for your observation. It's great to see you again. Uh, so do I uh, understand that you think 
there would be a possibility to test the boron lithium combination in Compass by the end of its uh, operational lifetime? It's uh, not under discussion. I mean, I didn't suggest because I see it first time. <laughs> but in principle, if it's promising or somehow interesting, uh, it might be done. But uh, we are now very limited. I'm just raising this possibility as a further discussion. I will contact them. Uh, 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 Renaud de Jarnac and uh, Honza Horáček, Jan Horáček, because they are responsible for this. And uh, the talk will be available on YouTube, so you can easily forward it to them, or, well, I'm always happy to jump into a Zoom call. Yeah. Okay, nice. I already sent the invitation to all talk <laughs> today. <laughs> it means they, they are, some people are joined already from Compass. Uh, but not the people uh, doing uh, doing uh, this lithium experiment. We are just analyzing data. I think there will be two papers, and this is the combination of boron lithium. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I think now maybe you you are aware about this that uh, lithium is not anymore, uh, let's say, suitable or uh, for for demo uh, machine. They are already focused on tin. Yeah, this is why we also uh, converge to the tin li tin film, not the lithium. Lithium is anymore uh, not uh, attractive. Uh, I suppose in this case you're talking about the liquid plasma facing components. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's that's true, uh, and uh, I think there is the the reason about the lithium that this this uh, tritium. Uh, absorption I think this could be the, this is the way this is the problem for for demo as I understood uh, definitely one of the issues yeah yeah and they uh, we, we are going if we are going to repeat the experiment it will be focused on tin uh, liquid metal experiment uh, or combination lithium tin and mm -hmm. probably this this could be also the chance everything depends how to create the samples and everything yeah yeah, this is a slightly different subject, I believe, because uh, this is properly for the plasma facing components, whilst um, in, in this case, I was discussing mostly the conditioning of the wall. So it's uh, just a, a thin layer deposition that is supposed to collect the cold fuel particles and impurities to prevent them from yeah. uh, but, hindering but, the plasma. But, yeah, but uh, it, it's certainly another important application of um, those lousy materials inside. Yeah. yeah, but we will have this fin everywhere yeah, on nice. Tokamak. Yeah, I saw it was distributed everywhere, this lithium. And we have the boronitride plus this lithium. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's oh, yeah. somehow, somehow analyzed. Uh, I don't know if they pay attention to the... To the I think um, the point is that if it's already there, then you might as well add a bit more and, and do the test. <laughs> exactly, that's why I'm talking. We are, of course, doing a cleaning, boronization very frequently, uh, but uh, I, will, I will send your presentation to, to Reno and Horacek, and maybe they will, they will find a way how to at least analyze the data. It means, you know, the, the thin layer. Uh, yep. Not exactly the application for lithium, uh, lithium limiter uh, or diverter liquid, uh, but to analyze. But the, to extract the knowledge, yeah. Exactly. And I would be very interested in, in helping out if there's anything I can do to. I think it's still uh, the part uh, the part of this uh, lithium experiment files, of course, uh, it's there. Probably it is still exposed. I mean, probably the, the layer is still there because nobody cleans it. Yeah? We will just we will do just uh, regular boronization soon. Yeah? OK, that's my uh, comment only. Yeah. Thank you, Jirka. Good to okay. see you, too. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. It was a it was a nice discussion. Um, uh, so we still have a time, maybe for one last questions. If there is someone, all right. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I I see that Naoko. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You have some comments to make. Uh, if you wish, I could uh, unmute you so that you can put up your points. Uh, uh, verbally. Now, go here you go. 
Uh, just uh, I'll send you the comments. So one thing is uh, the characterization of the bonding of the lithium and boron is different. So one reason is the different characterization is uh, lithium have a strong the bonding with the uh, deuterium and ions, uh, oh sorry, uh, the oxygen. So very easy to make a thick impurity layers on the surface of the coated layer. And second point is uh, you discussing about the uh, boron carbon mixed layer. Uh, such kind of the literature is uh, used to have uh, many kind of the experiment because uh, they use the uh, boron source as a boron carbon mixed uh, powders and also they use uh, lithium. That is uh, my comment. Hi Naoko, thank you very much for your comment. Indeed, I forgot to mention, I wanted to mention uh, the early experiments by uh, Sugai and, um, boy, there is another author, I'm, I really apologize. Hino? Uh, yeah, uh, Hino, I, of course. It's a laboratory experiment, yeah, yeah. I, and, I, and Toyota, I believe, was also involved in these early experiments. Uh, no, I, that, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I think they were uh, one of the first to uh, start doing characterizations of uh, uh, deuterium and oxygen uptakes in lithium. And uh, there is indeed a paper in 1996 where uh, Toyota presents uh, a preliminary experiment uh, with a co-deposited lithium and boron layer and its ability to collect um, oxygen, I believe. Uh, and this was actually, uh, uh, they actually used the same method. Well, I, I'll rephrase that. I used the same method as they, and it was, uh, in fact, a, an important starting point and inspiration for this work. Yeah, I, I think uh, you already checked the good literature as a laboratory experiment. And the little different point in the uh, devices, uh, Sterilator and Tokamax, is the uh, impurity effect is. Uh, so it's a difference to compare the laboratory experiment. Then the, uh, maybe the how changing the surface of the coated layer and also the, such kind of the uh, speed or how changing the uh, mm. surface by the sputtering itself, also such kind of mixed effect is a little difficult or yes. different compared yes, to the laboratory. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Erosion is something that I cannot study in a glow discharge experiment. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Naoko, for the observation. Uh, indeed, it was a nice talk, a great uh, interactive talk. And once again, I would like to remind you all that uh, uh, the links for surveys and for subscription will be made available on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages. And also, we will put them on the YouTube uh, video in the description link so that those who have not been able to respond to these surveys and as a matter of fact none of the audience apparently please uh, we would be very grateful if you could take a moment out when the video goes live or on the facebook or linkedin page and provide us some feedback it will be really useful for us very helpful to us to improve and keep bringing more such talks to you thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening everyone bye bye for now